Well, hey everybody, it's Sandy and welcome back to my channel dedicated to helping you advocate for your own health one topic at a time. So today I had an opportunity to sit down for a few minutes and meet via Zoom with two of the researchers at Axel Clinical. So I met with both uh, Laura Parahovnik, PhD, and Dr. Bruce Rankin, the physician researcher at Axel Clinical. And our purpose was to discuss Moderna. Axel Clinical partners with various pharmaceutical companies, medical device companies, biotech companies. So among other things, they do do clinical trials. And one of the vaccines for which they are doing clinical trials is the Moderna. Now they're also looking at others and I'm hoping that they'll afford me the opportunity to talk to them about some of those in the future. But today they took time out of their very busy schedules to talk to me and my viewers about the Moderna vaccine. So I hope that you'll stick around because I think you're really gonna learn something. So, all right, I'm gonna let you kind of discuss what you do. And then I'll just have a few questions. Are you able to answer questions specifically about the vaccine? Yes. Okay. All right. So. Yeah. So, so we're a dedicated research site. Um, we've been here over 20 years. I'm the principal investigator for most of the studies we do here at this site. One of them now being the COVID-19 vaccine trial with Moderna. Uh, we've been conducting that trial opened around the first part of August. And now is about to fill nationally with about 30,000 participants. So we've had a pretty good, robust uh, group of patients or participants come in and, and uh, um, enroll in that trial. Okay. And you are well into phase three, correct? This is phase three for this trial, yes. Okay. And Laura, can you... Can I just introduce you and can you, would you mind just telling viewers what you do with the company? And yes, of course. So my name is Dr. Laura Parahovnik and I'm a VP of clinical operations at Excel uh, Clinical Services. And uh, my function is to make sure that operations are smoothly related to all studies that were well resourced, well equipped, um, that everyone is doing their training and to assist staff to perform a uh, high quality study conduct uh, related to any potential study. So recently, uh, during new normal times, uh, we're doing COVID-19 related study, uh, vaccination study as well as prophylaxis study and diagnostic study at our different locations. And we make sure that we have high enrollment and um, data quality conduct uh, of this study. Okay, so you know, for today, I pretty much want to talk about the Moderna. Um, but Dr. Rankin, are you working on other vaccine trials for COVID, or is this the only COVID vaccine you work with? Uh, we're working on other trials. Okay, so could you explain to my viewers the the Moderna vaccine is a messenger RNA vaccine, which makes it very novel. Could you explain how it's different than other traditional vaccines? Well, most of the vaccines up to date have been either live or attenuated vaccines, which we, means we alter the uh, virus so it doesn't cause infection, but it will exhibit an immune response to treat whatever we're treating. We also do particle vaccines where we take pieces of the virus and we'll inject them and the body will respond to those foreign particles. We call them antigens. So we get an immune response before the body sees the actual virus, virus or infection we're trying to treat. The mRNA is a new unique type of delivery. What happens is that this mRNA protein is absorbed into our muscle cells. Our muscle cells process that and make a protein that is exactly the same as a spike protein that we see on that coronavirus. Everybody today has been able to see a picture of the coronavirus and knows those spikes stick out of it. Those spikes are very essential for that virus to attach to our tissue. And it's also an area where our own immune system can attack that virus. So by use of this mRNA, we produce those spike proteins with our own tissue. There's no foreign tissue in there. Our own tissue produces the spikes in a very small quantity. And that elicits, it, elicits that antigen that response our immune system sees to fight that fight the virus when it comes along, the real virus. So is it true then that that particular technology, if it works, will make it 
in fact, easier to produce other kinds of vaccines as well if, if this works well for us? Absolutely. We can use different mRNA protein sequences to, to produce that, to produce other um, antigens that are similar to different uh, viruses or bacteria that we see to uh, produce other vaccines. And the other thing is the process of producing the vaccine is going to be a lot quicker because we don't have to wait for that uh, vaccine to be grown in like eggs or embryos that the previous vaccines have been grown in. So we should be having very more robust production and quicker production in labs all across the world much quicker than we can with uh, with the old processes for producing uh, for producing the vaccine. Yeah, let's hope. Um, now, are there any other vaccines, or is Moderna the only one that works on with messenger RNA? So Pfizer also has their own uh, novel vaccine using the messenger RNA technology to deliver the similar type of uh, response in our cells to produce those spike proteins. So Pfizer is using the same technology. Do you do any clinical trials with Pfizer? Absolutely, we do a lot of work with Pfizer. Okay, so you're you have both vaccines you're familiar with. Yes, I am. Okay, uh, might ask ask if we can talk with you about that one another time. Uh, now, okay. in the phase one and or at least I guess the phase two, I had read that in in one of these phases you actually showed or are showing that you're getting a robust response in an elderly population. Mm -hmm. Is that's that correct? And that's unusual with vaccines. Well, the elderly have a, a more sluggish immune system, a slower response. They've actually been able, because of this, uh, the, the robust response they're seeing, they've been able to lower the dose several times on the vaccine because we're seeing a very robust antibody production. So there's been several uh, lowering of dosages. Um, and then also after the second booster, seeing that... Uh, 21 days or uh, three weeks, we're seeing a higher level of antibodies produced than what people normally produce with COVID illness. So we're now we have to still prove that those antibodies are working. So hence, that's the reason for these stage uh, three studies, these phase three studies to look at large number of people to see if vaccines better than no vaccine. So that's basically where we're at right now with trials. Okay. Now, does the vaccine provided you do make the antibodies, provided you respond to this particular right. vaccine, does it actually stop you from getting the illness or can you still get the illness and it's you're hoping that it's a lesser duration or intensity? Right, so both of those are endpoints we're looking at. Does it prevent illness altogether? Or if illness does occur, in other words, our PCRs are positive, does it reduce the severity of the illness? Do we keep people out of the hospital because they've been vaccinated? So both of those are quality endpoints we're going to be looking at with this trial to see if one or both things happen, which would obviously be a win for the vaccine. And so we have to wait on that until we're right. done looking that's at That's something phase. that's being looked at now. Um, obviously, incidence of infection and then how infection is between the two groups. Okay. Now, you know, recently I've read about this evolving issue of post-COVID syndrome, we're finding myocarditis or um, inflammation in the heart muscle in some like otherwise young, healthy people, um, blood right. clots, all different things. I imagine there's a lot of moving parts here, but is, is Moderna looking at that? Do they suspect that it'll be preventive? Because some of these I know we see even in mild cases of COVID. Yeah, those are all questions that still have to be answered. Um, you know, if they can reduce the uh, incidence or severity of infection, would that help eliminate some of these uh, more severe cases we're seeing, like the myocarditis, the renal failure, uh, obviously the uh, long-term lung issues where the virus attaches. So I think those will be some uh, spinoffs after they see if the vaccine works. And as we get down the road a little bit, um, obviously, if people are still having some infections with uh, vaccine with less severe, hopefully we'll see a drop in those uh, what we call comorbidities, those things that go along with an illness that can they can show up. So I get it just takes a lot of time. It's not just a matter it's of getting take the vaccine. It's a lot of time to answer a lot of questions. Right. Uh, I mean, we're, we're, the first thing is we're all hoping that a vaccine has shows effectiveness to uh, really slow down not only incidence of disease, but the transmission also. So those are all things that really are hopeful 
with these type of vaccine trials early on that we'll see those kind of uh, those kind of results. Yeah, that was my next question. So you just answered it with transmission. Yeah. Do you have to look at trend even if you're vaccinated? Is there yeah. an issue? Right. So we have to look at the transmissions, uh, you know, after people are vaccinated also to see if that, and that's when we're going to get global vaccinations. That's when that'll really come to play if we see a reduction in the transmission and a dropping off of the uh, COVID infection. Okay. I have two more quick, these are real quick questions for you. Um, is this going to come in the form of a single dose or a multi-dose vial? So the current trials we're doing are both multi-dose. So there's a primer dose initially, and then about three weeks later, we do a booster. They're seeing antibody productions after that first primer dose in about 14 days. But by doing the booster shot uh, in three weeks, you're seeing levels quantitatively higher. Those concentrations of antibodies are higher than people that even had infection. So the current studies we're doing are going to both be two shots. Uh, some of the other trials that are being looked at, obviously there will be other trials in the country. Some of them are one injection. Uh, I did already talk to some people today, but one injection. Some of them are attenuated by viruses for some of those one injections. So the current uh, trials we're doing right now are, are two dose uh, injections. Uh, All right. Program. So let me just clarify on that. Um, I'm, I guess that's good to know. But what uh, the other question I want to answer is how. How, how many doses are in the vial? So some people have concerns about, for example, multi-dose flu vaccine vials, where that means there's thimerosal in it as a preservative versus the single dose where one patient gets this one vial and that's it. So these are multi-dose vials, but once the vial is uh, prepared, all doses have to be administered. Isn't that correct? So there's no preservative in it. The, the, the current thing is that they're kept refrigerated and sometimes frozen. And those multi-dose vials, once they are um, thawed and prepared, all doses have to be prepared at the same time, or it's wasted. You can't, you okay. can't, uh, you can't save it. So it's going to be a multi-dose vial. At least that's how it's coming to us now. Uh, that may change as time goes on, but they prepare it in a single dose. But vaccine has to be administered once it's uh, prepared. So the thimerosal is not an issue. And then, uh, thimerosal, I'm very familiar with that as a preservative. Um, I'm not aware of any thimerosal in, in, in this product. Okay. Now, what about, does this product use an adjuvant? I know some vaccines do, some don't. Uh, no, because of this technology, we don't need an adjuvant because we're not, the, uh, the, the spike protein is there uh, and uh, it's being produced in cellularly, so there's no adjuvant with this particular vaccine. I have read some very early rumblings from a professor at Teleshomer of autoimmunology um, saying that he indicts, um, this is Dr. Yehuda Schoenfeld, that he has concerns about adjuvants, that he's, he's a pro-vaccination, -vaccin uh -huh. he's not an anti-vaxxer. But for people with autoimmune propensities, uh, if you happen right. to be making autoantibodies the day you get an adjuvant, you might be getting your whole immune system hepped up and make more autoantibodies. So this might be something for people with autoimmune disease to take some comfort. Uh, absolutely. So that would be approach. I know some other vaccines that are being looked at do have adjuvants in it to help, you know, boost or, or magnify that immune response. So they elicit the immune cells to come to the area and then obviously they attack anything that's foreign in that area. Mm -hmm. So those vaccines and a lot of vaccines we use use adjuvants nowadays. Right. However, with this technology, uh, they're not using adjuvants. They just have such a robust response that they don't need to uh, stimulate the immune system with adjuvants with this vaccine. Well, that's wonderful news. That does my heart good to hear that. Well, I, I don't want to take up any more of your time, but I just want to say I so appreciate your taking the time to talk with me. We look forward to following up with you as we need to. Thank you. Okay. Th thank you so much, Laura. Thank you. And everybody have a good day. Thank you. So All much the best with your work. Sure. All the best thank to you. Okay, guys, I'm sure everybody will let me know whether they found that helpful, informative. I know that I learned a lot, and I just really want to thank Drs. Rankin and Parahovnik for giving me their time and so generously answering my questions. I really hope that I'll be able to talk some more on this channel about some of these other vaccines that are in Phase 3 or entering Phase 3. So until next time, be well. Bye-bye.